I have a regret that I am not president because I think there's so much opportunity. Build real relationships, even with people with whom you vehemently disagree. You'll not only be happier, you will be more successful. Steve Jobs, speaking at Stanford, was asked by a young man, how can I be more like you? How can I become like you? And Jobs famously answered, think different. Success and happiness do not result from a single thing. They result from an accumulation of thousands of little things. Need motivation? Watch a top 10 with the Believe Nation. Top 10, top 10 I got a top, top 10. 10. Top 10. Got my motivation high for my top 10. Top 10. Gotta learn from the wise women and men. It's Evan Carmichael and I make these videos because chances are you are the most ambitious person in your circle, but you know you're capable of more and you get that push by surrounding yourself with the best. So today let's learn from one of the best, Joe Biden and my take on his top 10 rules of success. Enjoy. Okay, let's kick it off with rule number one. Find your inner strength. Do you feel Just you could have beaten Hillary? I've... Yes, but it would have been an incredibly difficult race. And I have nothing but friendship for Hillary. I have a regret that I am not president because I think there's so much opportunity. Mm. I think America is so incredibly well positioned. Um, but I don't regret the decision I made because it was the right decision for my family. Oprah, no woman or man should announce they're running for president unless they can answer two questions. Yeah. One, do they truly believe they're the most qualified person for that moment? I believed I was. But was I prepared to be able to give my whole heart, my whole soul, and all my attention to the endeavor? And I knew I wasn't. Were you still broken? My family was broken. I was broken. I still find myself when I talk about my beau, my, my son, yeah. who, who, who died. I sometimes uh, find myself say something about it and I can't handle it. I start to, I break down. Um, so it's not like it, it, it ever, the pain ever goes away. But what, you, what I do is I look at my grandson, his son, mm -hmm. and I see him. I look at my granddaughter, I see her, and I know he's still here. I know he's still, he's still with me. Rule number two, build real relationships. Resist the temptation of your generation to let network become a verb that saps the personal away, that blinds you to the person right in front of you, blinds you to their hopes, their fears, and their burdens. Build real relationships, even with people with whom you vehemently disagree. You'll not only be happier, you will be more successful. Rule number three, find your sweet spot. Like all of you, when I graduated, I felt a similar pressure. What will I do? But the script was written, find the best job with the most prestigious law firm you can. Be in a position to advance, to make good money, become a partner. That's what I did. I landed a job because of the help of my professors with one of the most prestigious law firms in my state, one of the oldest in my state. But the problem was, as I strode across the stage in 1968, the world had changed. Dr. King had been assassinated. There were riots throughout America. A significant part of my hometown of Wilmington, Delaware, was burned to the ground. We became the only city since Reconstruction to be occupied by the military for nine months. The National Guard in every corner with drawn bayonets, state troopers patrolling the neighborhood, not city cops. And I was home with a prestigious job. Because wasn't that what I was supposed to do? 
Wasn't that what I expected to do? But six months later, I realized that wasn't what I was supposed to do. And to the surprise of the senior partners in my law firm, I walked out of a federal courtroom, catty corner across what they call Rodney Square, the center of town, into the basement of the building on the far corner. And I walked into the public defender's office. And I asked for a job. Remember the guy holding, directing the office and his name was Franny Kearns. He said, aren't you with? And I said, yes. He said, you're making a big mistake. But like many of your parents, I was lucky just in time. I learned early on what I wanted to do, what made me the happiest. Family faith, being engaged in the public affairs that gripped my generation when I graduated. The civil rights movement, the environmental movement, the women's movement, ending a bitterly divisive war in Vietnam. Now it's your turn. It's your time. Time to attempt to find that sweet spot where success and happiness intersect. And it's not easy. Some of you will go into uh, and onto powerful law firms on Wall Street, government service, prosecutor's office, public defenders. Some of you will take the knowledge and be successful entrepreneurs representing and represent nonprofits. Some of you will serve in the military. Some of you will go back to your home countries and risk, risk your lives for the rule of law. But all of you will have one thing in common. You'll all have to figure out how to balance success, happiness, and ambition. Rule number four, have a vision. What I was struck by, I read that ever since you were a little boy, you were a boy with a vision, that you had a picture in your head of the kind of man that you wanted to be. Did you live up to your own expectations? Did you fulfill the vision or exceed the vision? I, by and large, um, uh, believe that I have uh, ended up being the man I wanted to be. But it wasn't in terms of accomplishment. Mm. It was because people usually translate that into, you know, as a young guy, I knew I wanted to be senator, I knew I wanted to be president. I knew I, but that, that wasn't true. Um, what was true was I wanted to live up to my parents' expectations. Mm. And I wanted to be that person that uh, my mother met my mother's standard, being defined by my courage. I wanted to be that person who, uh, who was, uh, no matter what happened, just got back up and kept going. I wanted to be that person who was there and loyal to people who, uh, who were loyal to him. I wanted to be there. I wanted to be that guy who uh, was, knew what was worth losing over. Also, if you want to build more confidence, the sign says it can take up to 254 days of consecutive action to successfully build a habit. So I've created a free program for you where every day for 254 days, I will send you an unlisted video to your email absolutely free to help you build your confidence. The link to join is in the description below. Who am I? <laughs> no, really, who am I? What do I care about? And the answers to those questions have resulted in the woman who stands before you today. When you pull it off, it's great. Same thing in real estate. You go against the tide. People are selling, you're buying, the tide changes. You have to explain why you're the right person to lead. And above all, you have to know your numbers. Rule number five, invest in yourself. When I uh, did my financial disclosure as vice president the first time, the Washington Post said, quote, it's probable no man has entered the office of vice president, assumed the office of vice president with fewer assets than Joe Biden. <laughs> I hope they were talking financial assets. And then there was all this discussion about why I had no money. I'll tell you why I had no money. Four years of Penn, three years of Syracuse, four years of Georgetown, 
three years at Yale, two years at Tulane, two years at Penn, and now a granddaughter at Penn. I was asked why I wore a Penn tie. My answer is I earned it. I earned it. <laughs> Rule number six, have compassion. And I mean this sincerely. There's nothing particularly unique about me. With regard to resilience and compassion, there are countless thousands of people, maybe some in the audience, who'd suffer through personal losses similar to mine or much worse, with much less support to help them get through it and much less reason to want to get through it. It's not all that difficult, folks, to be compassionate when you've been the beneficiary of compassion in your lowest moments not only from your family, but from your friends and total strangers. Because when you know how much it meant to you, you know how much it mattered. It's not hard to be compassionate. Rule number seven, earn trust. I've met an awful lot of successful people. I've literally met every major world leader in the last 42 years. Personally met them. so many others. People who by any standard are considered success, but I've observed, as I've gotten to know many of them, a significant number of them are not happy. I've worked with eight presidents. Only 13 senators have served longer than me in the entirety of American history. industry leaders, the sidecons of Silicon Valley, high-powered lawyers, doctors, nurses, teachers, social workers. And I made several basic observations that I hope will help you. Those who I observed to achieve both success and happiness, those who balance life and career, those who found purpose and fulfillment, They all understood that there's no silver bullet, no single formula, no reductive list. They all seem to understand that success and happiness do not result from a single thing. They result from an accumulation of thousands of little things with the common feature that they built their character. First, the successful and happy people I've come to know understand that a good life at its core is about being personal, being engaged. It's being there for a friend or colleague when they sustain an injury in an accident, remembering to congratulate them on a marriage or birth, being available to them as they're going through personal loss or failure. It's about loving somebody more than you love yourself. It seems to all get down to personal. That's the stuff that fosters relationships and the only stuff that breeds trust in everything you do in life. The way you earn trust. And I mean earn trust. Rule number eight, think different. Steve Jobs, speaking at Stanford, was asked by a young man, how can I be more like you? How can I become like you? And Jobs famously answered, think different. You cannot think different in a nation where you cannot breathe free. You cannot think different in a nation where you are unable to challenge orthodoxy because change only comes from challenging orthodoxy. And what you've learned at this great university and throughout this system is to challenge orthodoxy. That's why today our economy is still two and a half times bigger than any other in the world. Our workers are three times as productive as any worker in the world. High-tech manufacturing is coming back to the United States, and your generation has already joined the ranks of those who are leading the world in innovation and job creation. 
And we're about to enter an era of breathtaking change and progress. We're on the cusp of innovations that will literally change the world. And some of the people who I had the honor of being honored with today with degrees can tell you more about this than I can because they're already changing the world we live in. Rule number nine, stand up for your beliefs. You know, guys, uh, and particularly you women, every one of your parents, uh, every one of your parents, when they dropped you off on the first day of class or put you on a plane or a train and kissed you goodbye, they had great expectations for you. But along with those expectations for real was a nagging, nagging fear. Will you be all right? Not just will you be all right in terms of your grades. Are you going to be okay? They may not have known the statistics, but they know when they dropped you off that there is, you'd think the last place you'd have to worry about dropping your beautiful son or daughter off would be on a college campus. Should be the safest place in the world. And uh, the fact of the matter is uh, that fear is real. And for too many parents, that, uh, that fear uh, has been realized or will be realized. You know, when I wrote the Violence Against Women Act back in 1989 when I drafted it, and I literally drafted it. I mean, it's not because there wasn't, there wasn't much of a support at the time. As a matter of fact, not a single national women's organization, all of whom support me, not a single one supported the legislation at the outset because of two reasons. One, they thought that uh, it would take away from other issues, more pressing, choice, uh, gender equality, uh, um, equal pay. Um, and I think people, although they cared about it, thought maybe there's not much we can do about it. I think that was the, I think that was the underlying subconscious feeling. And, uh, um, and uh, the fact is that uh, we finally, we finally, after the, all the whole range of hearings and a lot of time, uh, we finally got, uh, uh, got support. I remember I called a meeting of all the women's and civil rights organizations in my office. I was chairman of a thing called the Judiciary Committee, and I was still pushing, and there were objections being offered on the margins. Well, you didn't want to increase the penalties for rape. You didn't want to do... And finally, Ellie Schmiel, who I love and is a friend of mine, was head of the National Organization for Women, said, literally, not a joke, she said, what are we doing? Why don't we support this guy? Why don't we support this guy? And everything began to change. Everything began to change. And rule number 10, the last one before a very special bonus clip, is have fun. My name is Joe Biden. I love ice cream. I'm an ice cream guy. Is ice cream down that way? Y'all gotta eat this ice cream. South Carolina is going to determine who the next president of the United States is going to be. You really are. You're the ones that sent Bill Clinton to the presidency, and you're the ones that sent Barack Obama to the presidency. And I have a simple proposition here. I'm here to ask you for your help. Where I come from, you don't get far unless you ask. My name's Joe Biden. I'm a Democratic candidate for the United States Senate. Look me over. If you like what you see, help out. If not, vote for the other guy. Give me a look, though, okay? Now I've got a special bonus clip that I think you're gonna enjoy. But before that, it's time for the question of the day. I wanna know what was your single biggest takeaway from this video and what is your plan of action that you're going to execute this week to make some immediate momentum happen. When you just get motivated and watch a video, you have a 35% chance of following through. That's what the science says. But when you write down what time, what day, what place you're actually going to execute, when you create the plan, you have a 91% chance of following through. 
and I want that for you. And when you commit to people publicly, you increase your chances even more of actually doing it. So I wanna know what your single biggest takeaway from this video was and your specific plan of action to actually get the result you're after. Let me know, put it down in the comments below because I want to celebrate you. My generation heard the same voices of doom and despair that your generation hears today. American decline. America's lost its way. Wither America. What those voices do not and did not understand is that in both instances, yours and mine, we graduated into a world that had changed. In the world of William Butler Yeats, writing about his Ireland in a poem called Easter Sunday, 1916, he said, all's changed, changed utterly. A terrible beauty has been born. Old answers, the policies of the previous generation that had served my generation so well had little applicability to the world into which I was graduating. On the eve of my graduation, Dr. King had been assassinated. The Vietnam War was raging. In the shadow of my convention, Robert Kennedy was assassinated. Our political system was in chaos. But as we strode across that stage to receive our diplomas, to a person, we were absolutely confident that the naysayers were wrong and that there were significant possibilities available to us. We ended the war in Vietnam. We ended the nuclear stalemate. The Soviet Union secured civil rights, fundamentally altered women's rights for the better, began an environmental movement that's far from finished, ushered in an information age that shrunk the world beyond recognition, and in the process, laid the foundation for a period of technological innovation that generated the world's strongest economy in the 70s, 80s, and the 90s. In 90s. If you want to change your life in the next 30 days for free, check out my training right here below. Or if you want to see the top 10 I did on Barack Obama, check out the video right there next to me. I think you'll enjoy them. Continue to believe, and I'll see you there.